Well, hello. Um, this is the last of the classes on Colossians. Maybe this is around the last Sunday in July where you are. I'm glad that we could uh, journey like this together. Scripture is rich. Teaching and preaching eventually kind of all comes down to reading the Bible really loud. And we've done that a little bit. But I hope that in the process of studying Colossians, you've been able to get on board with Paul in this notion that in Christ all the fullness of God is seen, is experienced in bodily form. In that in Christ, we have all we need. So that being Christ followers and inviting others to be Christ followers is really a great life. And being in Christ does not diminish us and to, to challenge someone else to, to think about embracing Christ will not diminish their life, not a bit. The greatest gift we have received is to come to know Christ. And the greatest gift we can give is to help someone else know Christ. This is uh, a part of the mission of the Highland Oaks Church. And I pray that in the study of Colossians, that, that mission, that sending, that sharing, that discipling, that that has become even more vital to all of us. So we want to begin uh, in the class today in Colossians chapter 4, beginning at verse 2. And I want to tell you, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, down through verse 6, to me, is just about as much fun as you can have in Scripture. So, I want to invite you to do this class with me, um, knowing that I'm really enjoying this, and I hope you do too. So, after everything that, that Paul has written, and he's just finished up talking about the husbands and the wives, and the parents and the children, the fathers, and the masters and slaves, and all that good stuff, and what it's like to put off what is evil and put on what is good and to live in love and peace and worship. Then he says, you transformed folks who are in the love of God and the peace of God and in the worship of God, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Now, given my preaching muscle, I can take that verse, and we got about an hour. But we don't really have about an hour. But this notion, devote yourselves to prayer. Give yourselves to being a praying people. And to do that, you're going to do two things. He says, I want you to be watchful for things to pray about that you, as a devoted person in Christ, giving yourselves to prayer, you have wide eyes for matters worthy of prayer. We watch around us. In the wider world, we watch around us. And there's, there's a lot to pray about in the wider world. I don't know what people prayed about uh, before there was 24-hour news. But now with 24-hour news, our, our prayer list can be pretty strong. We can be praying for the people across the street and for the people in Bangladesh where the, the rains are not falling or are falling too much. You're watchful, vigilant, 
We're, we're, we're watchful inside the life of the church. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful. Right now in the life of our congregation, the life is a little complex, but most every day we get an email out from the office and that email tells us something that's going on in a person's life. Often it's a loss, often it's a diagnosis, sometimes it's a hospital, sometimes, well, you know, all of the things it can be. Be watchful. And then we're watchful in our families. We're watchful inside of our own hearts. When, that, when your gaze turns inward and you're watchful in your own heart, that kind of self-examination gives you a lot to pray about. And let me just say something about prayer here. We could talk a lot about this, but, but sometimes prayer doesn't have many words. Sometimes to pray for someone is just to hold their, their face in your mind and just lean into the Father with their, with their face, with their name, with their situation. To just sit with Christ in the heavenly places and be silent with a heavy heart. And the end of all this, though, is being watchful. See, now, if you're watchful about what's going on in the world, it could put you in a dark place, right? It could put you in a dark place. But he says, I want you to run the risk of being devoted to prayer with watchfulness and let it end up in thanksgiving. I love that. Because a lot of times I pray about things that I don't know what's going to happen with this. I guess if I knew what was going to happen with it, I probably wouldn't be called to prayer. But to pray about what's going on with the virus and to pray and end up being thankful to God for his presence and his, his love for us, trusting him to get us through to the end of this to be thankful for what's going on in the life of the church, to be thankful for what's going on in our family, even with our nuts old nephew. To, to be able to look into your own heart and end up at the end of prayers, being watchful in our own hearts, not bitter or cynical or exasperated, but thankful that God is at work in our hearts, in Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Okay, you see, can you, can you get that? Do you see what that one verse can do? That one verse calls us to be watchful, but thankful. <laughs> there's, there's a, I just want to add this. There, when I get in discussions, very often when somebody's wanting to be the one who's going to be the smartest one in the room, they say something, it's like, well, I, I don't mean to be the devil's advocate, but... And I said, well, you can be the devil's advocate as long as you remember who you're playing for. Watchfulness in prayer isn't meant to give us um, the words of the devil's lies about us. We don't need to listen to that. We need to end up in the, in the arms of God in the throne room of God, giving thanks. Verse 3 he says, And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Wait a minute. Um, Paul, you're in Rome. You're sending this letter to Colossae, and you're saying... Pray for us, too, that God will open a door for the gospel in Rome. Maybe Paul still has this idea that he wants to go to Spain. He wants a door to be opened. He knows what it's like for the door of his house where he's under arrest is, where that door is opened. 
if he's in a cell, he knows what it's like for that door to open. But but he wants a door to open that he's free to walk out of. Where he's not bound by the chains. Pray for us that God may open a door for our message. And that maybe even if he's in chains, maybe somebody comes to the door. Maybe somebody comes to the open door who needs to hear it. And the very idea that those folks hundreds of miles away in Colossae can pray about what's going on in Rome in Paul's life, believing that God is going to do something because of those prayers. We believe that. We believe that we pray in Dallas, we pray in Highland Oaks, and God is going to open some doors in Cambodia. We believe that, that we're going to pray here, and, and God is going to open some doors at Bolt's home. That we believe we're, that no matter where we are, we have power to speak words into the, the very life of God so that God will act in a different place. We need, to, we need to take advantage of this geographical mobility that we have in Christ. Don't you pray? You pray for people in different places knowing that God can bless them there. And then he says in verse 4, Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. <laughs> okay. This is the Apostle Paul. His name's in the Bible. Now, he's written some serious material, and he wants the people he's never seen in Colossae to pray that when he starts talking, he'll say things like he should. Well, yeah. Don't you ever join Pat when he prays before he preaches? Don't you, when he is asking for insight and wisdom and imagination, don't you pray for that? You're not just praying that he'll get to the end of the sermon. You're praying for what happens during the sermon. That I used to have people that would pray that I would have a ready recollection. And I said, well, I could recollect it probably better if I'd collected it better the first time. But people pray for evangelists and teachers. They pray for them. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And then he switches it. And he says, now you, you need to be wise. You've got opportunities. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. The word opportunity there is the word for a beachhead where, where a, an army would land, like Omaha Beach. The army would land on that beach and then would take the ground. He says that you are going to have contact with people who are not in Christ and that contact is potentially a beachhead you are landing in their life. Make the most of those. Let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer everyone. Every moment, every contact you have with someone else is an opportunity to land in their life in the name of Jesus. Think of it. I'm landing in your life in the name of Jesus. That's why we don't really have the right to have our own time to be rude, crude, and otherwise socially unacceptable to the people around us when something happens we don't like. I've got a person on a Facebook list where I am who... On some days, he's sharing scripture. And on some other days, 
he's grumping about what's going on in the community and what the trash collectors are doing wrong when they collect his trash. We're not supposed to be two or three different channel people. We're supposed to be the folks who believe that every point of contact we have with other people is potentially Jesus landing in their life through our words and our personality and our life. And so I had a friend one time when he taught this passage, he says, this let your con conversation always be full of grace. He said, every Christian ought to know at least one or two really great clean jokes. I think that's probably right. So those verses, chapter 4, verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so sweet and good. And then Paul says goodbye. He's got a long ending. Tychicus is the man bringing the letter. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant. He is also going to bring with him Onesimus, the returning slave to Philemon. And he has others with him of note. Epaphras, the man who planted the church, is with him in Rome, verse 12. And then you hear about our dear friend Luke, the doctor, in verse 14. You come down to verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. The letter that talks about the supremacy of Christ, the letter that invites us to not keep the rules of this world, but to be dead to what is fleshly in us and raised from the dead in Christ and made to sit with him, the right hand of God. This is the letter that is giving us hope and giving us life. May we put off what is the flesh. May we put on everything that is like Jesus. And may we live in peace and love and worship. And may our life be a light to those around us. I appreciate you joining me through this process. God bless you all.